Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the 2009 Dennis Keeney Distinguished Lecture. Uh, the series is aimed to honor the uh, former Leopold director, uh, Dr. Dennis Keeney. Dennis grew up on a dairy farm near Runnels, Iowa, and, and uh, entered Iowa State University uh, and uh, completed his degree here in 1959, his first, his first degree, his bachelor's. Uh, he was, uh, I discovered, uh, his graduating class was the last class to graduate from Iowa State College before it became Iowa State University. Uh, he completed his master's and, and doctorate and then took a faculty position at the University of Wisconsin in soils and water chemistry. And in 1988, he came back to Iowa State University to serve as the first director of the newly created Leopold Center. As the center's director, Dennis pioneered research and outreach on agricultural issues related to sustainability, land resource use, rural community development, <coughs> excuse me, and water quality. His vision for the center was a catalyst for work uh, others were reluctant to approach. It yielded a host of innovations, multidisciplinary research teams, many of which continue today, uh, the support of basic science, improving soil testing and nutrient management, and broad-based grants program. In honor of this legacy, it's my privilege to introduce uh, this year's Keeney Lecture Speaker, Dr. Eugene Turner. Gene is a faculty member in the, the Department of Oceanography and Coastal Sciences at Louisiana State University, sometimes an oceanographer with his feet in the watershed and sometimes an, a, a wetland ecologist uh, with his feet on board a ship in the Gulf. Uh, he he uh, <clears throat> serves as a chair for the International Association of Ecology's Wetlands Working Group and as an executive board member of that same organization. Gene is a prolific research scientist with hundreds of research publications. Uh, in 1988, he was a recipient of the National Wetland Award, the U.S., and in 1999 for their work on the hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Dr. Turner and Nancy Rabelais were co-recipients of the Blasker Award for Science and Engineering. Uh, Gene collaborates regularly with the Land Institute and the Greenland's Blue Waters Project on land use issues within the Mississippi River watershed. Uh, drawing on uh, his, his experience in these collaborations, Dr. Turner has titled his, this evening's lecture, The Mississippi River Water Quality, Policy, Farm Landscapes, and Hypoxia. Before we turn this over to Dr. Turner, uh, I need to acknowledge uh, support from a, a number of groups. Uh, uh, Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture, uh, the ISU Committee on Lectures, uh, and a generous donation from Dennis and Betty Keeney. Now please join me in welcoming uh, this year's Keeney Lecturer. Uh, thank you. It's nice to be here. I've had many friends here, and it makes up for the losses I've had wrestling when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I've known uh, Dennis Keeney in several ways, um, and I try to find a little bit more out about him. Uh, and so, of course, I went to the internet and tried to find younger pictures of him. And it didn't say, it said this was Dennis Keeney in the picture. Uh, the vehicle seems a little uh, newer than I might have expected. And it didn't identify which person was on there. Uh, but there's three different kind of views on this. And one is, is that uh, he's in front of the pack, which is actually the case that uh, Bill Crumpton, Dr. Crumpton, just discussed about being the first head of the Leopold Institute, which was kind of a one office, no chair uh, office when he arrived. And they managed to scrounge that up, plus a really good staff, and get it on the road. And starting up these organizations, uh, even if they're partially accepted, is, is always difficult, you know. And so he had to uh, work with, uh, he was also a colleague in all that. And I've known um, Dennis for the last, uh, I think it's the last eight or so years, working pretty intensively in the watershed on this issue. And he's been a great colleague, and he's a colleague to many other people. Like, you know, he's, he's helped him in ways that nobody really will know except for those two people. And, and I'm sure Dennis and, uh, would acknowledge the help of his wife, Betty, or maybe it's 
he's her husband. <laughs> and, uh, and so the last one is that he's also been watching the back of a lot of people and also on this issue to see what, what issues are coming. So he's had uh, articles and things he's been writing and, and kind of uh, pushing nicely but firmly about uh, issues about energy use, cropping patterns, and other things. So he's been all three of these things for the time I've known him, but in different degrees. And I might come back to this at the end. So uh, the things uh, I'm going to talk about in order, and this is kind of the roadmap, and I may be a little repetitive uh, to get a different angle about each part of these, are hypoxia and its relationship, hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico, and the relationship of water quality uh, down at our end of the pipe, as we say. And then some thing, issues about landscape and policy, and then a little bit about what future Iowa might, uh, what might happen. And uh, I did this accidentally, but I made Iowa and green and uh, Louisiana blue, because there is a green waters, blue water, G green lands, blue water group are part of. Uh, and also, uh, we're all part of the same watershed, but we're also part of the Louisiana Purchase, which is where I am now. I'm not from Louisiana, uh, except for the last 35 years, or 36 years. Yeah, so. Uh, so just as a start, uh, I, th I think a lot of people here know about this, but just as it's form a baseline, just go over that it's about the watershed. Our watershed is about 41% of the US, the contiguous US. And it's about, uh, well, you know, 80% managed for agricultural uses. And that little green, uh, red uh, at the end, on the bottom of the pipe, down here is the hypoxic zone. And I'm going to go describe through what it means to be hypoxic. And just as a scale, up here is Lake Erie, and that's the same scale, the size of hypoxic zone. So uh, we've occasionally, my wife Nancy Rabley and I have been working on this along with uh, several other collaborators, notably Dubrovko Ustik and uh, Bill Wiseman, who's no longer involved, and Berlin Gupta, but many others. And when we give talks, uh, we've given one to uh, the governor of New Jersey, uh, Todd Whitman, who uh, became head of EPA for a while. And we said, well, it's about the size of New Jersey. And she'd step out of her co coterie of bodyguards and say, please don't say that. It's not the size of New Jersey. It's some other state. So it's actually about the size of Massachusetts uh, sometimes, which we started. And she became the head of the EPA. So that was kind of a useful to know that she uh, knew about it. And so if the size of this at the bottom isn't always the size one year to the next. It does vary a lot. And this last year was particularly unpredictable size for some. But just to give you an idea, it runs from the mouth of the Mississippi River over to the Texas border. Sometimes it goes way in, into Texas. Sometimes it's contracted. It may be narrower, but there's only a limited amount of sh space on the shelf for this uh, water mass to be because it gets deeper than, say, 100 meters, 300 feet fairly quickly uh, when you go off, off the end. But the currents are going to the west, so the water is also dropping things out from the surface to the bottom, which you'll go through from east to west, and, and it's seasonal. Uh, this is the size of the zone for the times that we have measured it uh, for the last, since, in a consistent way, since 1985. Uh, these are area square miles. Uh, the red mark on the top is the long-term average. The uh, action plan goal is at the 2,000 mile mark, uh, square miles. And the five-year average for the last five years, at least, is up, except it excludes 2009. Eight, yeah, nine. And you get an idea of where the target is to reduce it to and where is it has been. And also the variability on it. There's one year in which it was a drought. Now there's one year we had no data. There are other years we have some measurements, but they weren't done in a consistent way. And if there's any warning I would give to you is don't get between my wife and the oxygen meter because when she's out of the boat, because she's very firm about where it goes to all the way down to the bottom in a certain way, and she's been doing this regularly year after year after year in a consistent way. Uh, there's other places in the world they haven't done that, and you get less preci precise results out of it. So it's seasonal, and this is a, from 85 to 93 as an example. For one place, which is marked at the top in that yellow zone, there's a dot where we have a station. And the oxygen goes up and down throughout the year, but it's in the summer that this always appears, sometimes or almost always. And 
It appears sometimes in February, sometimes in January, but it goes away and comes back. But then by April, May, and June, it's, it tends to be there consistently until the end of the summer. Things that would change this would be you get storms coming through and mix up the water column, gets re aerated, and uh, so forth. So it's not there all year round. And the definition of hypoxia, which is also on here, is that it's less than two milligrams per liter. It could be in the water column, it, this is in the bottom layer. So it could be uh, 10, 12 milligrams per liter somewhere in the water column, but this is a fact, an issue about the water in the, on the bottom. And just to go through, why is it, the question is, why does it have less oxygen than full saturation? Why is it less than what's in the surface water? Well, the reason uh, it's lower below is because it's, the oxygen has been consumed uh, as decomposition of organic matter in the bottom. And that organic matter is coming because, lo and behold, we have it actually from the Mississippi River. There's nutrients in the Mississippi River. It acts as a stimulant. It grows algae. And uh, they are fed upon and they die. Now, most of the organic matter in these very small green algae are actually diatoms, a particular kind, but at any rate, they don't sink as a mass to the bottom. They're consumed by just a slightly larger organism, zooplankton, which eat them, and they produce a little fecal pellet. And the fecal pellet has a little mucilage around it. It's not flaky. And these sink like proverbial rocks to the bottom. They don't stay in the water column, kind of, you know, take their time. Who, who wants to eat me? You know, they just go straight down to the bottom pretty fast. That means on the way down that almost all that organic on the surface survives to the, to the bottom. That means when it gets down to the bottom, that, that organic matter is there, is, that's where it's decomposed. So pretty much all on the surface makes it way down to the bottom. And the other thing is when it gets to the bottom then, it's decomposed, and at least it's primarily by, by bacteria. This is not a sexy process. It's just little small organisms, you know, chewing away gradually and decomposing things. And the reason, I'll show you some pictures, but the reason it's called the dead zone, well, there's probably several reasons. One is a newspaper a reporter liked that term. And the reason they liked it because there's no fish or shrimp. Anything that mobile can, can get out of the way from this low oxygen at that concentration leaves. Some organisms can't get out of the way. Sometimes they get trapped. And I'll give you an example, but, so, but mostly the marine life that can move will, will leave. And I might add, if, if for some reason people can't hear or I need to speak up, please raise your hand and I'll try to respond. So here's what the water column looks like. It's not uh, a uniform water column. It's not well mixed, which is the second part of this, is that uh, there's, uh, the surface water is warmer and it's fresher. It's coming from the Mississippi River. It's been heated on the way down, and so it's a little warmer. And this acts to stratify the water column, and underneath it's colder, and of course it's saltier. So the uh, if you, the ponds, if you've been swimming in any pond in Iowa, you may have some stratification, and you notice that when you dive off the dock or into the water, that it's colder on the bottom. And that reduces circulation. That tells you that it's not mixing well. And oxygen in the air, which could re-aerate the water column on the bottom, is restrict, and it doesn't enter as well. So the stratification keeps oxygen from re-entering the bottom water below as the oxygen is removed by decomposition. So there's, the effect is, when the stronger the stratification, the less mixing there is, the less re-aeration there is. And so this consumption of material on the bottom then is the second part. So it, it's the organic matter that's added and then also the, the reduced possibilities for re-aeration. So there's a physical component and then there's a biological component which keep the oxygen low on the bottom. So if you look at the formation then on the bottom, it's not like uh, this is a, let's say if it's 20 meters, let's say it's the height of this, the water depth is maybe the height of the ceiling here. It may be the only the level I'm standing on below that's low oxygen. It may be further offshore that it's 30 feet thick. And it depends on where you are on the shelf because it's sloped. And it depends also on currents coming back and forth. Now if the shelf is sloped, like in this picture in the left here on the bottom, and the, the wind is blowing from the south, that means the water is pushing this way, and the water from up here then has to go somewhere, so it goes, goes back out. If the wind is going to the north, it's going, going south, then the water has to be replaced by water coming up from the bottom. And what that means, it can suck this low oxygen area closer to the, sh 
the beach or it can push it away depending on the winds. And when it pulls it up to the, the beach and organisms are trying to leave it, they're trapped. And so you may get dead fish accumulating on the beach because of this. They have nowhere else to go. They're trapped. And if it's a natural phenomenon like it's been happening in Mobile Bay, they call it a jubilee because uh, the, they aren't actually dead, but they're morbid, and you can get them, and you can gig them, and they're easy to catch, and they're all concentrated. So it's called jubilee, you know, great. You know. And if you want to, you can uh, collect them, and you can give them artificial respiration and put them back in two days, and they'll be fine. <laughs> so this, isn't, this is the largest area. I said nobody smacked their lips when I said that. <laughs> So this is uh, one of the largest hypoxic zones in the world, but it is hardly the only one. Uh, this is a distribution of all those red dots are uh, hypoxic zones that we now know, or it's presumed, to be driven by what's happened in the water quality in the local drainage basin. So there's about a 400 of them. There's about another, another 100 that may not occur every year, but they come and go. So it's, it's hardly now. Uh, uh, uncommon to have this off of countries that are what you call economically developed. If you, if you mapped out where the uh, high population and intensive use of land is in the world, you'd find a hypoxic area next to it. It might be more severe in one area than the others. And find places that aren't so developed, they have low density and they have uh, less intensive use of land, you won't find the hypoxic areas. And these areas on the bottom graph, bar graph, the general idea is, is that as far as we tell, it's not just a matter of oh, we've finally gone out and looked for them, that the distribution of these over time has been increasing. And it's actually been increasing in the same time period that this explosive use of more of land and fertilizer use and you know, grow, uh, rapidly developing population growth. So. So again, why is it called the dead zone? Uh, I'll show you some pictures, but if you look in the surface layer, uh, there's some divers going in. Uh, this is Barracuda. Uh, there's a, the middle one is a mooring we put out. You can see it's very green. There's uh, some fish on the leg of the uh, uh, platform that that equipment is attached to, but there's it's some pretty amazing uh, fish down there, actually. It's pretty colorful. And then on the upper uh, right, the way you're looking at it, are some jellyfish, uh, which is not a comfortable spot to be. And uh, there, are, there is life in the upper layer. It's the bottom layer that's not so uh, healthy. And as it turns out, as the hypoxic areas develop, we get more and more jellyfish developing. So that's, that's also a problem for varieties. In fact, in some places, you've got not only more jellyfish, you've got jellyfish than they eat the jellyfish. You've got a larger jellyfish showing up. Uh, lion's mane is a huge one. So on the bottom, here's this not so attractive, you know, uh, site. And our budgets are low, so we have very cheap diving equipment. That's a flannel shirt. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, the, what's the brown area and the two uh, shots on the diagonal are, it's just a bacterial, it's the fecal pellets coming down and it's the bacterial mat. And where he's dis disturbed the mat here, that is a guy, I'm sure you can tell, and he's put a tube down into it. That black spot is where he stirred it up. It's very fluffy. It's bacterial and mat. So, and underneath of it, there might be sulfide coming up, which is toxic. So you actually have to be careful diving because that's a health hazard. So it's really, and that's about it. There's, there's really nothing else. Sometimes a crab will get caught, and that one's definitely dead, and this. And sometimes you'll see, you know, it's not so epoxic, but it's getting lower. You see uh, starfish doing you know, their permanent push-up because uh, normally they're found in the soil, in the sediments, but they're pushing themselves out of the sediments to get you know, out of that low oxygen area. And we have brought some back to the boat and some of them do recover if the oxygen's not too low. So that's why it's called the dead zone. It's because in terms of the kind of uh, local interest in harvestable shrimp and fish, they aren't there. And sometimes you get massive uh, fish gills uh, like this including shrimp. They just have, they get trapped, there's nowhere else to go. Or it develops around them for some reason, you know, and it surrounds them and they go the wrong way, of course. We have pictures of uh, videos trolling through the water at the interface, and we can see squid floating up the top layer out of the oxygen zone, low oxygen zone, and dipping down and then catching something, you know, doing something in the sediments and coming back out again. So there are kind of organisms, in this case squid, you know, hanging around trying to find some you know, easy to catch prey. 
Now here's an issue. Uh, the, you, I don't know if, how many of you know what croaker are, but they do make a sound. It's a fish that croak. And I can't do a good job of imitating them. But if you have cats or chickens, you may be, uh, they may be living off these croaker. They're a bottom feeding fish. And what's shown on the left is the red area is covering up the hypoxic zone and there were no croaker inside that zone. And so they, and, but in years without hypoxia, they're spread across the shelf. And the same thing on the right hand side is the shrimp distributions, uh, which again, are, they have left the area. Sometimes they seem to be concentrated on the edge, but other times not. Um, they just, I just saw some results, uh, which uh, they ch showed that the fish inside the hypoxic, around the hypoxic zone versus way away from it, had a very different sex balance which I think is a behavioral issue, not a, you know, a physiological change, as far as I know. There's other things coming out. Uh, and the, the concerns about this are, one, this is 30% uh, uh, 25% of the all fisheries in the U.S. are from this coast, coastal zone. So th this is, a, and for Louisiana, this means uh, a few billion dollars in dockside value, and it's somewhat threatened, but there isn't, a closure of the fisheries. There isn't a, a massive loss of fisheries. It's on the edge, perhaps. We don't, we don't know how much of the potential has been lost because of this. The shrimp have to go for the migration for, uh, they spawn offshore and then they, it's like a female lays a million eggs and one, one male and then they get fertilized and then they, they move into the inshore wetlands which are on the other side of this barrier. And so there's a concern about that as well. And then on top of that, like of a lot of other industries, there's other pressures on the fisheries, and this is just one more issue. How far do they have to go to find them, find the shrimp to trawl them? Uh, that costs gas money. They don't know where they are, as you know, it's things like that. So it's one more issue for the fishermen, of course. So the question should arise is, is this a natural phenomena? So I want to address that directly in a few slides. First off, it's not climate change. Uh, if, the, if there were a climate change issue on this, it would show up in river discharge. And one reason for looking at river discharge is because it is, does, it's intimately involved in that stratification of the water offshore. It reduces, you know, if it's stratified, the oxygen doesn't move back and forth from the atmosphere to the bottom as easily. And this is a 1817 to 2005 record from Mississippi River discharge. It really has a lot of variations in it, but there's no long-term trends. We could show you other records just to indicate that there's a lot of variability in climate, but there's no long-term trend to explain this appearance of hypoxia in the last several decades because of some climatic issue. It's driven by the biology, uh, which is driven by the nutrients in the water. So, but in order to show that, we had to go through a reasonable uh, list of questions, which was that, well, if you had this new appearance of hypoxia, and you say it, and it, we think it's connected to the higher nutrient loading, and it has this reaction, and so forth. Well, was nitrogen really, did it go up? Was algal production higher, even if you had, that went up? And did the concentration really go lower in that time period, or is this just something we discovered? And are there records of this surrogates, proxies? For this, and then what do models tell us? Now, I'm not 100% uh, convinced about models. They're, we have a saying, uh, garbage in gospel out. <laughs> you need to have data, you need to be suspect about assumptions in the models, and whether, and so, but I'll show you some easy models. The first thing is that uh, the red line on here is nitrate in the river at New Orleans, the end of the pipe. Uh, from 1954 to, well, present, and it continues on like this. And it definitely has gone up. And, if, and we also have measurements for 1904, 5, and 6, and 1933 and 34, and they all show actually lower values than 1954. Nitrogen has definitely gone up, and also silicate, which I'll come back to, has gone down. And they're now, um, it used to be that the silica the nitrogen ratio used to be four to one, now they're one to one. And that's important later because diatoms require at least a one to one ratio, and diatoms are the organisms that are falling to the bottom. And I'll come back to this. So diatoms have silica in them. It's in the shell, which are shown on here, and that's the hard, it's kind of a glassy uh, outer non, uh, uh, it's not alive, but it's the shell they secrete around it. Very specific to certain organisms, certain diatoms, you can tell them by species. 
and you can measure what it is as biologically bound silica. And the diatoms are what the zooplankton eat, and the zooplankton are what the fish eat, the, the fish we want. So they are, they are the food web that uh, is important to the offshore fisheries. So here's the uh, nitrogen loading and the biogenic silica in the bottom. The green is the nitrogen loading. That's from the river for over a period of time that we have the records for. And the red is the biogenic silica representing the estimation of how much diatoms have been in the sediments. And what it shows then is that the, the, the surrogate for diatoms has gone up and down with the nitrogen loading through time, which demonstrates this coupling you would, we would expect if nitrogen is limiting to diatom growth, nitrogen has gone up, you should get this response. And we've done this kind of dating of sediments offshore uh, at, I don't know, we've probably got 30 or 40 cores, uh, and they, they tend to always show this. Uh, sometimes there's hurricanes and we don't get a very good record. But it's just like drilling into a tree and getting age rings on a tree and then looking at what's in the ring of the tree. Only oh, the tree doesn't work quite that way. But we can date the sediments, look at the chemistry of the sediments, and reconstruct the environmental history. So that part fits. We have an indicator in the bottom a very nice thing about universities, well, they're strange attractors, as statisticians say. But uh, we have a very wonderful friend, uh, Barun Samgutu, who looks at 4M and Nifera, which are usually used to prospect for oil. But there's one of them that's very tolerant of, of oxygen, and another one that's intolerant. So if you find one that is int uh, you know, you, you find one or the other, you can determine whether it's become hypoxic or not and using that ratio. And so we've done that, and sure enough, the intolerant, the ratio changes at about the time that the same fluctuations as that biogenic silicate goes up and down. And this index now has been used in Long Island and, and Japan and, and other places. I mean, it's not just us saying this. Other people are using it for the same purposes. So we have a historical proxy of the changes in this diatom and that shows up as well, which is nice. We like to have multiple lines of evidence that the conclusion is robust. And the other thing that's kind of very, you know, I'm not sophisticated, <laughs> I'm not sophisticated about a lot of things, but particularly modeling, but we have very simple models using the nitrogen loading in May. You can predict the size of the hypoxia in July. Very simple. These are, and, and if you work backwards, there wasn't enough nitrogen in before 1980s to have a regular occurrence of hypoxia. Uh, the dips in these are, uh, as it turns out, when hurricanes take place or some major change during the summer around the time of the cruise. So we have a very simple uh, model that uses the nitrogen loading in the river to predict in May, again, three months ahead of time, what's going to happen. It isn't 100% as we found out this year, but it, it works. And that, and that the discerning person out there that likes to look at graphs would notice that the, the position of the white and the black dots change with each other. If you look at the ratio of those, you get how large is the zone of hypoxia on the Y part is for the amount of nitrogen loading you had. In other words, how much hypoxia you generate for that nitrogen loading. And it's been increasing. Every year, we get a little more larger as hypoxic zone for the same amount of nitrogen being added in the river. And again, the breaks in that, I think this time I have arrows, nice, yeah. Those breaks are when hurricanes or very large storms occur right at the time of the cruise. But the general drift is that it's going up. So that in effect, if you're trying to reduce the size of the hypoxic zone by reducing the amount of nitrogen in the river, the message here is that the longer you wait, the longer it takes. And the, the explanation for this is that that organic matter that's falling every year to the bottom doesn't all get consumed that year in the bottom. It's actually some of it remains in the sediments. And next year, it's, it's being consumed. So there's a legacy effect from one year to the next. And if you look at the sediments to so the carbon signature, how much is there, it is building up through this period of time. So there's this legacy effect. It has a memory. And it's going to take a while to burn that off, even if you shut off the nitrogen in the, ox in the you know, Mississippi River magically you know, uh, in one year, it still is going to have some hypoxia in the next year because of this, mem this legacy effect. And the longer we wait on that, the longer it takes. The other thing about this graph is that it pretty much goes down to a zero in the 70s. Other graphs uh, sh showed you a couple other ones. And that, again, substantiates that 
uh, as far as we can tell, the kind of large-scale picture of hypoxia on the bottom really was only, is a recent phenomenon. It's not historically, you know, one that we just re discovered. It's one that's just come up in the last, well, in my lifetime, maybe not some of your lifetimes. So, so yes, increased nitrogen loading in the river at our end of the pipe, which is that something's happened on the upper end, has led to more phytoplankton and more algae, more production, lower oxygen, and it's been very easy to model using only nitrogen. So we feel pretty good about nitrogen being the driver, and that's man-made. So the list then to go down the important factors for hypoxia is the main one is stratification. There are some issues about currents, and it's nutrient-enhanced primary production, algal production. And you get this flux of material to the bottom, and the consumption exceeds the reaeration rate, and it's directly proportional to nitrogen load. There's no uh, feasible connection between something that's happening further offshore, uh, upwelling in Yucatan, a low oxygen zone that's lower but not hypoxic in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. It's not carbon loss from wetland loss, you know, carbons from wetlands being lost. It's too small. It's not carbon uh, being loaded in the Mississippi River higher mouth. It, nothing, none of those uh, are quantitatively or uh, significant or they don't have a mechanistic way to make that connection. And the things then, and I just went through some of those things that are unimportant, that was that list. So, so there's some other issues here then about alternative states. It's not just that this is the way it is now. There's some other things that are, this isn't, uh, I realize hypoxia is kind of the poster child for some discussions. Uh, it's, it's the largest area. It's uh, a significant area, significant fisheries. Uh, but there's other things going on that happen because of the nutrients being added. And I want to go through two of those. First is, go back to this, uh, ratio of nitrate to silicate. Only in the last 20 years or so has that ratio been one to one, which is at the threshold at which you start to not get diatoms if it's below one to one. And I, there's a little, you know, one of those obscure academic things. Uh, this offer, officer and writer uh, about these ratios, and they said, and they predicted, that if the ratio is greater than one to one, you tend to have diatoms. If it's less than one to one, you get flagellated algae, other kinds of things other than diatoms, including harmful algal blooms. Now, what are harf harmful algal blooms? They're things that we don't seem to have a rigorous definition of why taxonomically they're one or the other, but they may produce toxins, they may produce swimmers itch, they may produce something that you don't want to eat because they cause paralytic shellfish poisoning. They're an obscure bunch of organisms because in terms of evolution, they're really weird. They're working in an environment that no, they didn't have many nutrients when they evolved, and now they have a swimming, swimming in a sea of lots of nutrients, and the way I as a parent describe their behavior, you don't know what's going to happen, but it's like teenagers, you know something's going to happen, and you can't quite predict it. <clears throat> and this uh, graph above here, it, with the red in it, is a ship, a 120-foot vessel, and all that red is a uh, harmful algal bloom, a red tide in the Baltic. The other thing is if you don't have the diatoms, then you don't have the predators, which would be the zooplankton, so you have fewer of them. And also, if you don't have the diatom, the zooplankton, you don't have a desirable fish community, you might have undesirable ones. And when we've gone through the times when this off our shelf, the ratio has gone a little lower, we get these reactions. We get harmful algal blooms, we get uh, fewer zooplankton and the pellets that show up because they are or aren't there and so forth. Uh, and that ship, and here's another picture of the Baltic, and that's again another ship out there, and this is a different kind of a bloom. And I think I have one more, the Po River. And this is a worldwide occurrence around the hypoxic zones. We often get, but not always, and we don't always get the same species, get these huge blooms. And they may, it's because of this excess amount of nitrogen or phosphorus being added. And off Louisiana, we see the same thing. And this is a record in the, uh, on the bottom is the years. And on the vertical are two different ways of looking at the same data, which is this pseudo niche of pungens uh, that is a harmful algal bloom, and in this case, th th this algae produces demonic acid, but not always in this uh, species, and it produces uh, the, the, re uh, the response, uh, the response is um, 
Um, oh, memory loss, I forgot. <laughs> so, uh, gotcha. So, and, but it hasn't happened, but it's definitely gone up since the 80s. And they've had this harmful algal showing up at the same time, coincidentally, in, in coincidence with uh, the officer, officer and rider effect. So it's, it's actually, you know, some of the theories the academics came up with actually worked out pretty well in this, unfortunately. So uh, the second issue, and this is a new one that's, that's brewing. I can't say that, I'm from Louisiana, so I can't say this. Uh, they haven't been terribly active at the end of the pipe and, you know, trying to push what's the water quality improvements through the watershed. And as a receiving state, so to speak, of the water quality changes, I think they would be a little more interested. But they're going to get interested because there's wetlands, and we've lost about 18% of these, about the size of Rhode Island is gone. And when they're going through some restoration efforts, uh, using water from the river to di be diverted into these wetlands. And two of them are at those uh, yellow arrows there. There are substantial diversions. Uh, some people don't think they're big enough, and they're 100 million, <laughs> yeah, small change. And, and the area to the, on the far side is a wetland that's been damaged by oil and gas uh, dredging. And it used to be a carpet of wetlands, so they wanted to go back to be a carpet of wetlands again. And so they're adding nutrients from the river. And the idea is they're nutrient starved. But uh, what does that mean, nutrient starved? Does that mean we should help these starving wetlands? It means that if you add nutrients above ground, you may get more above ground biomass. But I've spent time up here, and I've learned some things from you guys. And see, it didn't show up. And this is a consistency we find with wetland systems and also with grassland systems at times, but in our wetlands, that if you add nutrients, you get less organic accumulation, you get soil decomposition is faster, the roots don't have to work as hard and forage for nutrients, you may get fewer roots. The soil strength, because these are organic soils in Louisiana, uh, isn't as strong because you don't have the roots, and also this organic matter that's built up for a thousand years is being built up under low nutrient conditions is going away, and you may even have the wetlands sinking. So what I'm saying is that, uh, that you have fewer roots that have less soil strength, you have less organic matter, you have weaker soils, and when a storm comes, they lift off. So it's exactly the wrong thing to do to add nutrients because these wetlands were formed under low nutrient conditions before the river was enriched, and now we're adding nutrients as part of a restoration strategy. And they're also trying to add sediments with it, which turns out to be an arguably trivial exercise. And on the right-hand side are the marsh balls that formed during Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina in the path of these diversions. And they're, you can see they're broken off. And what's happened is that the soil has lifted off from the substrate underneath. Maybe it's a 12 inches thick or so. And they lost, uh, I think I have some aerial pictures, they lost 50 square miles. In, in the path of one of these large diversions. And that view in the back over there where it says Alliance Refinery, that's an oil and gas refinery, and you can hardly see it. I mean, the landscape is all soft mud in February, and that's only something you would send a graduate student out into. <laughs> you know, you'll sink up to your knees, and it's hard to walk around. You cannot make forward progress. And this is what it looks like here. Now, if you looked at it in terms of uh, and later in the summer, you might see a carpet of green of spindly grass coming up, but it's not supported. It's a very soft, mushy soil. And, and the trappers would tell you, and I have been out there before this, you could walk in these marshes. They may have been a little soft, but you could walk out there. You know, so this is a major change. Uh, Louisiana is asking for billions of dollars to restore their wetlands. And this particular aspect is being compromised, I'd argue by the addition of nutrients. And I think this is going to wake up Louisiana to say, you know, there's two reasons to improve water quality in the river. One is their wetland restoration, and the other is the hypoxic issue. So uh, where is it coming from, the nutrients? Well, this is the short of it is, is that land use drives water quality. And I'll zip through some slides about this, but it's uh, in several ways to go over this. And I really, so, um, this is Tennessee. It's not only you know, water quality, but all land use driven by dry, change of soil. This is still happening. It happened in history, and I'll give you an example, and it's happening now. The land use you know, changes sediment loading into the river. It changes nutrients. So here's how it might have started. Uh, this is a blue stem prairie, 
next to root system next to uh, wheat. And you can see the difference in the uh, root structure, how deep it goes. A lot of you appreciate this here, but a lot of people don't. I mean, they're New York, from New York City. They don't appreciate this. It's that the rooting system holds the soil together. It's foraging for nutrients. It's, uh, and the leakage from a continuous blue stem, a native cover, and don't worry about the units, is 11. But if this is from a Missouri study in the 30s. Uh, when it's plowed and fallowed and so forth, it might be 200 times that. This is without fertilizer. This is just the use of the land. And now in the 2000, there's a paper I can reference. It's about another two times that. In other words, it's about 400 times, 380 times higher when you add fertilizer. So the natural system was very conservative about the nutrients and leak, doesn't leak out here earlier, easier. And the modern system, very intense use, a lot of application of fertilizer, which nitrate is a very leaky ion, and it comes off very quickly. So there's two aspects. It's land use in terms of disturbance of a soil system and not allowing it to kind of act to conserve nutrients and also the more, because it's being farmed more intensively, and also because we're adding nutrients to it, which just increases the likelihood of, of leaking out. To change the nitrogen loading we've seen in the last 50 years, you only have to lose about 20% to see the result we see at the bottom of the pipe. So it isn't like, you know, you put it here and everything goes down there. Not all of it goes down, but you only have to have a change of about 20% and let's see that it come up. And of course, we've gone through these landscape changes before. This is Iowa, kind of the poster child of uh, farming before and after and the farm going bad and the soil being lost. We've, we've, we've addressed these unexpected results in the past and now we're at our limits in many ways about you know how we use the land. Uh, how do we uh, learn from the history of our use and what are we gonna do about it or what can we do about it? Uh, all right, so here's an example of the changes from 1900 until now. The, the blue line, what I've plotted here is uh, the fraction of the watershed in cropland on the X, and the vertical is the nitrogen coming off of it. And you could see these landscape changes using water quality data from 1905, 6, and 7. Well, through 12, but most of it's from 1906 and 7. And you can see that blue line, there was a change in water quality just from cropping changes 100 years ago. And now you add the modern equivalent uh, example, which is that the same watersheds now, and these are large watersheds, this are through the whole Mississippi River Basin. And you see the, you see the same reaction, which is that we have more uh, nitrogen coming, higher concentration for the same watersheds, but now it's a higher slope. But the interesting thing is that it's almost a zero intercept. The natural system is fairly uh, tight and it really does hold a lot of nutrients in, which of course tells us something about how we need to address some of these problems, which is to look at the natural processes to be conservative about this. So we could see these landscape changes happening uh, 100 years ago if we knew quite what we we're looking at. And we have this nice example that our uh, uh, distinguished uh, I can't call you senior because you're much younger than me. Uh, uh, and Bill Compton uh, did for Iowa, uh, which if you look at the percent of the land that's in cropland in a watershed and the, the concentration of nitrate, it goes up very nicely. You know, the more uniform the soil you're looking at, the better graph you'll get. And uh, I know Bill's working on this some more. It's very clear that the land use changes uh, affect the water quality coming off. Uh, the uh, Changes in the cropland have happened quickly over time. Uh, you can see we've got these nice county by county maps datas, uh, data uh, from 1850 to present. And you can see how the landscape for the whole US just in 150 years, just bam. And I, um, Iowa became a state in what year? 1846, right? And that's about the time this transformation really started to take off. And it may not, I, I had very uh, vigorous grandfather, I guess, and father. That, my grandfather was born in 1848. For some of you, it might be your great-grandfather, but it's only in a few generations these, these major changes in the landscape have taken place. Uh, this is, uh, I'll skip that. So what we can find in this offshore sediment core uh, is that we see this pattern in changing land use over that history. 
If you look on the bottom, it's that biogenic silica record, the production, the relative indicator of production offshore. The first arrow going up is coincidental when the Europeans moved into this landscape. It's, it released nutrients from the soil. And since trees, they weren't harvested for timber, they just cut down. It was plowed, and we see the population went in. We had this release of natural capital, nitrogen, uh, going in, and it had a reaction offshore. The next one on there, the small arrow, is the time when we drained wetlands in the watershed. And this is also a very large area of water, I mean, land actually. And then we had a second release of nitrogen. And the last one is the most dramatic and the highest one, which is the current era. And plotted in uh, uh, black on there is the, the nitrogen loading from the river. And it overlies very nicely, as we saw before, the picture of bi biogenic silica, the, the diatoms offshore. So we had these disturbances in the landscape, and we saw some reaction offshore. Most, we, might, we think there may have been a, some hypoxia that may have showed up occasionally, but not for the whole shelf and not for long periods of time at, e at each of these earlier bumps. But the persistent one definitely was in uh, the last 100 years, 50, uh, well, since the 70s, so that would be 40 years. So I think the story is complete on that. With land use drives a lot of water quality changes, and the land use changes have been driven by other factors. And I don't want to leave out that uh, the water quality changes we see at the end of the river, I feel like if things are taken care of, not, well, how would you put this? If issues are, we're, we're, I'd be glad for have you all be happy with your water quality, because I know it'll, it'll affect the result down at our end of the pipe. Well, I'm glad to be a, have, a, we are a poster child that helps drive the issue, but really these are local issues as well, and this is the thing that means a lot to people everywhere they live is what's the water quality, and it turns out that about half the waters in the U.S. are unswimmable or unfishable by health standards, which are, uh, some people wouldn't claim they're strict enough. This is a, a measure of uh, U.S. Uh, stressors by category, which is that about 30% of the U.S. waters streams and wa are not have are uh, stressed notably by uh, nitrogen phosphorus, but there's also other stressors on them. There's lots of local issues about water quality, and then, of course it also reflects what we're doing in long-term health of the soil, which is the issue for farming. I mean, this is maybe just a shadow of other issues and how well we take care of the land. So I want to go over quickly just a couple of issues about landscape and what we might look at in terms of policy. And so I know you all don't care about this too much, but I'll go into a little bit about Farm Bill. So uh, this is a picture of in the uh, normalized dollars of the total net farm income uh, in the black line on the top. So that's, uh, if you can see, of course, there's, it's gone up and down. But it's, let's say it's at this level, uh, 30 billion or so. And what is on the light line below is the normalized dollars for the subsidies to the farm in normalized dollars. But the gray line is what interests me. If, if you look at the subsidies, they're actually a small part of the gross of, a, of the, and I'm not a farmer, so I know I don't, don't learn a lot about this. But the subsidies aren't actually a, lar the, a large percentage of the farm costs. I mean, half of it is fer right now is fertilizers, li lime, potash, nitrogen, phosphate, fertilizer. But that's the subsidies don't make up for very much of that. But they make up for a lot of the net. There would be no profit for a lot of this if there weren't the subsidies. And the percentage of the uh, net is on the right-hand side in, in black. And at sometimes it's 20 or even 40, but mostly 30 would be a kind of a reasonable high. Uh, percent of the net is due to subsidies. <coughs> now, what do those farm payments do? Well, people are reacting to a constraint of uh, social and you know, economic issues when they choose crops and what happens to it. So we looked at, I'm going to show you a couple graphs. On the bottom is the total payments in per acre. These are farm subsidies per acre, and these are for large watersheds. And what's on the vertical in this one is the percent of the watershed that is in corn and soybeans. And it's, it's of course, a, I think a very reasonable thing to, if you get subsidies that favor corn and soybeans, you're going to end up probably more likely to, to plant them. And I didn't expect this tight relationship, actually. It is not proof, but it is a strong test of proof uh, of whether there's, there's a causal connection between it. And this is for most of the watersheds in the 
in some uh, for the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, if you look at the diversity of crops chosen, and this is an example from 4178, I'm saying the diversity of crops, I mean, we're going to call it the Crop Diversity Index, has changed greatly from when there were many crops, and this is for an example somewhere in Iowa, in, uh, I've forgotten where it was, but uh, it, it doesn't matter, uh, that the diversity of crops, of course, is much less. Now, people who uh, live in cities are like two trophic levels away from reality. But uh, you know when you drive out that uh, the homogenization of the landscape is accompanied the mechanization of the landscape for a lot of reasons. And if you look at the crop diversity versus these payments, that goes down with more payments. The payment structure it reflects the loss of uh, the, the loss of diversity in the landscape, and we know that the law, the diversity in the landscape affects other things, uh, wildlife, uh, water quality as well. And here's an example for water quality. This is the percent of the farmland that is fertilized versus those same payments. So what I'm saying is that the farm bill policies, which are directed uh, for crop subsidies to just a few crops, and some and a few of them get much higher per acre, you know, returns than other crops, uh, they're driving land use. And it's, that's not a criticism, I'm just saying that it, it's consistent with the idea, and I'm taking this maybe further than expect, that the same subsidies could be driven to other policies. So, uh, I'll, and here's the kind of reaction to this, which is that as farm payments get higher, the farm size goes up, the number of farms go down, the crop diversity of the index goes down, fertilizer applied goes up, the nitrogen coming off it, and we have other graphs, goes up. Uh, farm payments go, if they're less, you get more likely to have organic farms, although they're only 1% of the production, but also the fossil fuel goes up. There's a whole cascading series of decisions that happen when you have a farm policy that favors one choice or the other. That's why you call it a policy. It's supposed to work that way. So what I find, they have uh, several uh, discussions, you know, depending where you are, about with natural systems and intensive croplands and how we're going to get ecosystem services. And this is a very nice paper by Foley et al. in which they go through this discussion. And I find there's some things missing from this argument. And maybe it's because these are often urban people, and I, I can't, I, I worked on a dairy farm for a while, but I can't claim to be an agrarian. So the questions would come up is what are the other things this, the, that we are using nature's, uh, using uh, land services, what we want. I mean, there's other things on there besides just a dollar profit and just for making a profit this year. In other words, there's questions about sustainability, which is the focus of the Aldo Leopold Institute, which remarkably started 20 years ago or 25, uh, way, way ahead of the curve on this. And the thing that's missing off this argument is humans, <laughs> the culture of agriculture. We have a very mechanized uh, system. And I would ask, I would argue that we should be putting culture back in agriculture. And it might be crazy because, you know, we're not exactly a uniform people. And your fine thing might be somebody else's uh, crazy thing. But we ought to be working in that direction to do that. And we have the Farm Bill resources to do that. We have the resource of the Farm Bill to have a wider discussion about using those same resources to have different out outputs. And here's an example of some outputs, and I'm just going to focus on the fourth one. And this was an example from Minnesota that uh, George Booty and several other authors, authors did. They went back and forth with some scenario testing, and they looked at what would happen if we used the same resources and had local choices, and they used standard models, USDA models, and they, they, there's just nothing uncredentialed about this. It's kind of, you know, peanut butter jelly approach. There was nothing fancy to it. And they found out uh, that, that the set of, for the same amount of money, resources that they had, if this more regionally applied, not this homogenous national policy, they'd get less sediment coming off, less nitrogen by two-thirds, fewer greenhouse gases by 70%, and so forth, a whole variety of what you might call ecosystem services. And the bottom one, or the one above the bottom, is actually very interesting, is that you actually took less farm payments but the profits on the farm were up by 70%. Uh, how did that work? You know, is that only apl applicable to that site? Prob well, in a general sense, maybe not, but in a specific sense, yes. 
But there are, in other words, we aren't going through a level of experimentation, and this is what I would argue for, is to go through those resources we have and not ask for more or less, not to punish somebody, but to go through scenarios and use this on the ground. So some implications to what I'm then going through, and I'm, I'm hardly an original proponent of this, is, the, is, the, is that these coupled things, uh, the kind of hard and soft places we have in society mm -hmm. that would put the farmland in by conflicting choices for the use of the land and the output, you get, uh, they're going to be compromised in the future by changing fuel prices and so forth. We now have, for what used to be one acre, one calorie of effort, you got 10 calories of food out of. Now we're putting 10 cal 20 calories of energy in to get one calorie out. That's a shift to 200. And anybody that thinks that fuel prices aren't going to go up and that we have a problem with it, it's going to be compromised, you know, eventually. We're, those are going to change all these reactions. And there's other issues about, uh, you know, you get, for one dollar, you get a certain amount of calories as fructose, but you actually, for one dollar, get fewer calories out of uh, more wholesome foods. But we're subsidizing, basically, fru fructose production in many cases. And without taking a value statement about what wants to do as an alternative, I think we need to go through that discussion. And the only way I know to do that in a meaningful way, and in the long term we're going to have to do it, is to have very large watersheds involved with people, tractor salesmen, pr uh, priests, uh, you know, mayors involved, so that the whole watershed has a way of dealing with how we deal with the whole system. Because there's many dimensions to this. And we're not going to change our ways uh, with this kind of piecemeal approach of um, special interests, then we're going to have to find all these difficult, you can imagine making a, well you do know, making a decision in a college town about planning. It's not easy. There's all these different elements, you know. It's not a smooth, linear process, but we're going to have to learn to do and go through that in order to change, uh, I think, the way we're using the land and have a sustainable uh, system. And I would argue to take these, I, I would like to have USDA or whatever, uh, have ten a competition for ten large watersheds for twenty years. They can do what they want with the resources for that watershed. But you have to decide through a reasonable process and have this competition so that it could be done for twenty years. You have a dependable amount of money. You have a community that could depend upon this and go at it. And you know it's like making sausage. You don't want to know quite how it's done, but it may turn out to be pretty good. And if you have people go along with it, you may find a way to, to actually work together more instead of more divisively. So as Iowa goes, I would say uh, Louisiana ends up changing for better or worse. And that also goes because you have such intense use of the land, uh, you, want it, you, want, you want it to go that way. Because Iowa has about 3 million people, but Houston has 2.8 million people. New York City has 3 million people, and you know what? They don't know much about farming. They, don't, they have never touched a cow to pull milk out of it. I mean, well, use instruments now for that anyhow, but uh, they are making decisions on a different scale and they don't have the practical experience that even urban people in Iowa have They never go on a farm. You pick up a lot of things. So you, you want them to make decisions for the watershed or you want them to make them with you and to have you take a role in making those decisions. So I would say it's in, in our, the people in this room here, it's my interest. To, for us to make our own uh, efforts at this as difficult as it is to be, and don't ask for some hero to make the decisions for you. <clears throat> and so uh, you have these questions is put forth. Is you, how do you keep l working lands working? It's not a question of getting, being mad at farmers. They're in a context of many other forces. And how do you keep the communities healthy? And how are you going to address, address all these other issues of so forth uh, that are coming up down the pike. We have climate change issues, the potential for plants to work in a certain, you know, warm and wet climate is going to be different from a drier and a cooler climate. And we have all these other things, especially interest groups and biomass conversion and so forth. So for some of us, it's getting closer to the end than others. Uh, well, it's always getting closer to the end and we don't realize how quickly it's going. But I like this quote, which is not that we don't have day-to-day -day issues that we have to take care of, but in terms of working on a meaningful things that work, that really make your life worthwhile, it doesn't say it's going to be easy. But if you're only working on problems, as Wes Jackson says, it can be solved in your lifetime. Maybe you're not thinking big enough, really. And that, that would be 
uh, real, and I think that's, that's that view that instantaneous gratification of one year certainly isn't working very well for us. In five years, you need to think longer than that on this. So uh, here we are with Dennis, and uh, I, I really uh, wish you all luck on uh, working towards this. I know there are, I know, I know two dozen people in this room, and I know there's excellent efforts on this, and I know you need support. And I would say that universities are at one place that are uniquely uh, available to help in this, but they cannot become like a business. They have to be supported as a university. So we have all these ways of doing this, and not everybody can be Dennis Keeney. In fact, you should be yourself on this and try this in different ways. And I can tell you, uh, I can still remember when I could run uh, as a cross country, and things will change much faster than you expect. <laughs> and it's going to come much faster than you, you can, but you, it is possible. Yeah. So, and uh, I want to end with uh, thank you, and I'll be glad to take questions for anybody who wants to hang around. Enjoy being here. Thank you. <laughs> you, uh, do you want to moderate questions? Yes. Uh, the question is uh, about large storms, and in particular this storm that just pat they actually missed Louisiana. But when storms come in, they really uh, they change the direction of currents, and they may actually cause so much turbulence that the water column becomes homogeneous, and it does reaerate the water column. And it, in the summer, it might take another two two or three weeks to set back. But strangely enough, there was a hurricane that came in the Yucatan that did not stir up our water column, but it changed the currents. It actually went, uh, it, homog you know, the, it brought in oxygenated water into the area for a while before it set up back again. So the physical oceanography, the way currents move water around and that is very important. And so we actually, when we do our modeling, the prediction every year for epoxy, I, I remove those years. I mean, it just doesn't seem fair that if there's, uh, five or ten foot waves out there for the period when we're measuring the size of the zone that year that it should be concluded in the prediction. So. Yeah, yes. What is the projected economic uh, impact of the hypoxic zone on the economy? Uh, the question is about the impact of the hypoxic zone on the local economy. I don't actually know that there's a good record of that. Uh, we don't know, we know that fishermen are having a hard time out and the fishing industry is, has other pressures on it, including imported shrimp and drives the price down. Um, if you compared the, if whatever effect on the local Louisiana issues would be, it might be a few billion dollars and it hardly compares with the size of the agricultural, uh, you know, output from the, from the watershed. And uh, I, if, if we did this strictly on a money basis, well, we'd be doing a lot of things differently. And we, of course, maybe we're at the vulnerable end, but we would say it's a stewardship issue. Yeah, of course. Yes? Um, we have, like, a lot of rain up here causing floods and stuff. Does that cause more nitrogen to run off the field? Like, so you're thinking about last year's flood or the uh, year before? Yeah. The question is, um, if you have heavy rains up here, how does that contribute to the loading at the end? Well, uh, you you get more nitrogen loading, and it would be proportional to, you know, how much extra came down from those rains. Like, it was high in April and May, and it came down about three weeks later. So that did add to the size of the hypoxic zone that year quite a bit. I mean, and actually, we have a little project to figure out just how much that is. We're on that. But... Sure, it adds to it, and it, 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 it uh, percolates through the soil. So whatever uh, soil water is there that has nitrate in it, it gets flushed out, of course. And there does not seem to be a saturation where you, you get so much water coming out because of precipitation, you, get, you start diluting the nitrate concentration. It really stays quite high. There, so, uh, yes? Was 2009 an anomaly? Yes. What process? Oh, <laughs> uh, so the uh, 
two question is, uh, and correct me if I don't get the essence right, it was 2009, an anomalous year, and the second is, is there any advantage to hypoxia? I mean, with, I only usually hear about insults, not <laughs> the uh, benefits. Uh, for the first, 2009 was a uh, really low year. We expected one of a record, and we got almost a record high, and we got almost a record low. And uh, that's related to climate issues that uh, changed the way the water moved. For in, and you could see this in Texas. Texas had a record drought. And there were, the, the currents move according to the, it was a drought because of changes in wind patterns. And the wind patterns drive the, the currents, and they pushed up the water in a different way. And it wasn't developing at all. Just, and it was a strictly a climate issue on this. And we were pretty surprised. There was a storm or two, but I don't think that was the issue at all. It was in. Uh, the second part is any benefits. I don't know of any offhand, except that nobody's being asked. Well, I don't know what the benefit is offhand. Mm -hmm. I can tell. That's actually a, I'll have to think about that. There, there might be a benefit somewhere, you know. Oh, oh I know. Well, there's one. Uh, I, we got a call every once in a while from people who want to benefit from it, and we got a call from a biofuel person, and I talked to him several times. And as uh, to make the story short, I had the third call, I said, you know, you, you have too much money, don't you? And, and he said, he, he volunteered, that, you know, I have too much money. I have made money twice on um, biofuel things, somewhere in Panama, somewhere else. And if you're in the audience, I'm not insulting you. And he said they, they bought a boat in, in Mobile, which costs several hundred thousand dollars. They rigged it up with a net, and now they're going out to harvest the algae in the bottom so they could turn the algae into biofuel. And he had no idea how thick the, about where it was. He didn't know how thick the water column was, and he didn't know what kind of algae were there, and he was going to make a lot bundle of money on this, which is a pretty, uh, he, he had lots of money to, to spend. Because <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. I'm sure it is. Yeah. Yeah. A what? Like a forest fire can be so devastating, but yet advantages can come from that, from that devastation. Well, um, one of the things that epoxic layer uh, issue does is that layer on the bottom is uh, it really kills everything in the sediments. And that is the food that then becomes uh, eaten by uh, the fish when they come back or the shrimp that come back. And that's an issue that lasts, it takes about two or three years for those things to come back. So it's repeatedly swept back and forth. The, the zone goes back and forth, east, west, north, south. And then it, and it comes back every year and it keeps knocking that system back. And it would recover, though. It would recover. But that is not a benefit, as far as I can tell. Uh, so I, I have to think about that. <laughs> yes? So besides the increase in agriculture over the last 150 years, do you see um, the increase in human population and uh, increase in sewage and just being a component of well, you know, Bill Crumpton's here, and he actually was on a panel that looked at that. And uh, the sewage runoff, uh, there are, you know, agriculture is not the only uh, contributor to the nitrogen load, but it is the dominant contributor. And I don't remember quite what the panel came up with, 15% for urban systems. All right, so, you're not, so right, uh, urban systems uh, are starting to fall apart with increased pressure and lack of maintenance. But even so, they're still around 15%, I guess, for the total system. And um, I have seen somebody claimed it was nitrogen from golf courses and things like that. But that tends to be kind of a uh, even lower percentage <laughs> on the whole. Uh, yes, and then I'll go over here. Yes? What, what promise do you see in uh, public awareness of the emergency? And then secondly, um, I wanted to ask about computerized agriculture, GPS technology. Um, do you see that as beneficial? Um, well, first off, well, let's start with the tool first. Uh, some of the tools we're coming in to address this are helpful, obviously. I think the underlying issue we have as humans is uh, we want more and more. And in fact, we have less and less per person. There's now, each of us in this room right now has four acres per in terms of land that's farmable, I mean, you know, livable and usable, not, not the Antarctic and Arctic. We have about four acres and a half a piece, and population is growing. And so we have limits 
to what we have to use. And we're asking for more and more all the time. And in fact, the industrialized countries are always asking for more. It's like we're very uncomfortable with just being by ourselves and having lower limit. And I, there's, the new generation is always the one that's, you know, you know, you guys are going to solve the problem we gave you. So uh, I, I think that asking the technology is a tool, and the, the greater emphasis really has to be on the tool maker, because we continue to ask for more and more from less and less, and we have to ask for, be a little satisfied with less, and we might actually be happier with that, including a reconnection with natural systems. So that's. Yes. Do you have any luck moving this discussion into the agriculture departments at LSU? <laughs> well, uh, not much. <laughs> and and part of the reason uh, is that they're so interested in things in state, and um, we're we're talking about things out of state that for for the most part that are driving water quality on our end of the pipe. And these are national policies, and we will never solve national policy issues without state by state. And in fact, of course, within state, like any other state, there's regional differences in politics and you know things to to change. So it's uh, been difficult, I would say, in Louisiana. And I, th I think one hook is going to at least do have them dwell more effectively with this wetland loss issue because they're expecting to get billions of dollars to help, and they maybe have the wrong policy. <laughs> it's going to be a little embarrassing. No. And we and we finally did get the chancellor. We have we have an ag side of campus, which I'm not part of, and we have the other side. They were unified, but I got at least our side to agree to sign off on this agreement we have with uh, seven or eight land institutions, land grant institutions. Uh, I don't think Iowa signed off on this. Iowa State signed off on this, uh, you guys. And um, but to, you know, work cooperatively at that level. Uh, so you know, it's slow going. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, could you elaborate more on the wetlands that they diverged the river to? Did, like, what effect that had, or if they're trying to do something more with that? You mean uh, with about the nutrient issue on that, or just wetlands in general? Just the, the one, the two that they had diverged Oh, well, that's an emerging issue, as they say, <laughs> because the research is just coming out. I think it was such a simple, I mean, it, it was... Um, I don't know, I want to get a little home stuff, but it's an issue that's developing because these experiments have been done and we have an explanation. And you know, the, the more you ask for consensus, the more likely you, from political units, the more likely you'll get some action out of it. And in this case, they're asking for a lot of money to help restore the coast, and they're asking for consensus. Everybody agrees it's when we need to do, you know. <coughs> and the institutional response to questions is, all right, go away. You know, go away. So they've had the same consensus issue now for at least a decade, and there's, these questions keep creeping in. You know, we go. You know, we're not so interested. So uh, you don't get asked back to the table. It's a little bit if you ask for roads. It's an understandable reaction if you ask for tax money for a road. You say, well, you know, we want ten million dollars to fix some roads somewhere. It's very different if they put on the map we're going to fix this road, we're going to fix this road in this order and that order. You're more likely to have the tax passed. So we're in that dilemma of you know the power of the politics versus the actual reality on the ground, and it's it's interesting. That's <laughs> and there's going to be some big kickback on that because uh, people are going to be disappointed, which is also an opening to make some changes. You know, so yes. Do you think it's a worthwhile investment to put all that money into? Well, clearly it's good to have the the wetlands that were there, but is it? Good to put all the money into developing these wetlands that aren't what the natural conditions are. When maybe we could put the money towards developing wetlands up here, so that we reduce. Uh, well, there's two parts. Uh, we don't. We have wet, We have nitrogen also coming around out of the mouth and going back on the seaward side and coming back. And I would like to uh, do no harm. Policy, you know, I, for, uh, my first issue down there with all of this restoration is do no harm, don't make it worse than it is. But the other question is about, I think, uh, where is the best place for the wetlands? Is that your, and if you have a concentration of nitrogen that's 10 milligrams per liter in some upper part of the watershed, it's a lot easier to remove the nitrate from it than if it's two milligrams, which is at our end. And so it's much more cost effective to remove the nitrogen at the upper part of the basin than it is down at the bottom end, if you had a successful way of doing it. 
So I would say cost-wise, it's much better not to apply it. But if you're going to take care of it when it's running off the stream, then it's at the edge of the, uh, edge of the field. You put the wetlands there, and you don't try to you know do more and more engineering. You make it as simple and as close to the natural release point as as possible. So of course, I'm not only in the United States, but in Denmark. I mean, the ag fields go right up to the edge of the stream. It seems kind of silly, but they do it. You know. I could let this go on all night, but um, I'll, some of you might not be willing to do that. So if we could limit to maybe three or four more questions, let's talk. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, changing practices to affect water quality, and you mentioned, I think, culture and politics, or values and money, you put it to. Which one of those do you think would lead to the most lasting change? Uh, people's behaviors. <laughs> I mean, our willingness to uh, uh, ask questions, and to include more than your immediate, you know, sphere, and to be willing to engage in all aspects of the landscape and other people. In, in other words, if uh, instead of looking at me and other, and we look at it as we kind of approach, and it's much more encompassing. This could be a sermon at a church, but uh, you know, the idea that we're insular is just ridiculous, and in, in practice. But that's how we we often act. Of course, and, and, and the, you know, there's this Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. Of course, we all have, one of the first ones is you have to have uh, food and security in some way. That's a, kind of a natural one, but we're way behind that and way over that in a lot of uh, the way we treat a lot of these resources. It's, well, I want more, you know. And greed is not a great organizing principle in any religious structure. <laughs> But uh, that is tends to be an operating structure for a lot of decision making. So, um, in the back, uh, you have red hair, I think, in the back. Right. Well, can, uh, oh, I was looking at the young lady next to you, but please go ahead. <laughs> what can uh, Iowa farmers do to lower nutrient loading of water systems besides riparian buffer zones? Well, there, there's these technical issues of. Uh, Point. The question is, how can Iowans uh, reduce their nitrogen loading? Uh, one is to use less. Uh, there are, uh, other, if you could put perennial, I know there are people working on putting roots on corn. If we could have more perennial cropping systems, that would do wonders. Uh, more pasture land and find out ways, you know, make that work. Uh, which is uh, some a lot of people say that's the natural model is to have long perennial plants out there. That is the natural prairie system. Uh, technically, you know, there's these other issues about pinpoint farming, precision farming, rather, uh, buffer strips. There's a, I listened to a nice talk today by somebody looking at these uh, denitrification boxes you have, which are in place, and they're learning more about uh, in, in which the tile runoff, which short circuits the whole water system. There's 9% more water coming off the agricultural land now and going into the river than it used to because it's short circuit, it doesn't get evaporated. It it's a big chain of hydrology. So, but you can sort your, put that into a box with wood chips in it, and if it's handled right, it could remove a lot of nitrate. Um, you could not use tiling, uh, change crops. I mean, you'll, you'll have to work out those problems, and Bill's willing to stay for the next hour to tell you <laughs> exactly. And then the, the last. Uh, so the question is about the relative role of nitrogen and phosphorus in affecting the size of the hypoxic zone. Uh, it looks like there's enough a normal circumstance that phosphorus is not limiting in the sense that it's useful in predicting the size of the zone. And we do some experiments we occasionally find in two glass tubes that there is some phosphorus limitation. And I, th I think uh, I can demonstrate, but I haven't, you know, this is not peer reviewed. Uh, that it's the balance of nitrogen and phosphorus that really has a big change. On the uh, if you have the right ratio of nitrogen and phosphorus, you get a huge increase in the uh, chlorophyll, the algae production offshore. But normally, it's been nitrogen limitation. Uh, there, you can demonstrate some phosphorus limitation, but I can't find it in on the ground. Way of, I know you can find it in the test tubes and some experiments, but I can't find a consistent on the ground offshore way of demonstrating a, a magical, I mean, a role of uh, phosphorus in limiting the size of the zone. So, and which says that there's probably enough there. You 
Yeah, other things take precedent. That was three, so.